Hello, I am Debbie Ginsberg. I'm the Faculty Services Manager of the Harvard Law School Library. Welcome to the Harvard Law School Library Faculty Book Talk Series. This talk is being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel sometime after the discussion. Check out our scholarship at Law Blog for more information. Thank you to Dean Manning for his generous support of these talks and a big thank you to our team, Maya Bergamasco, Rachel Parker, Teresa Knapp, and of course, Jocelyn Kennedy for putting together this series. We welcome your questions for our panelists and invite you to use the Q&A feature throughout the talk. Time is reserved at the end for our panel to engage with your questions, so be sure to ask them. And please visit your local library or your local bookseller for a copy of today's book, Power to the People, Constitutionalism in the Age of Populism. It is my pleasure to introduce our authors and discussants. Mark Tushnet is the William Nelson Cromwell Professor of Law Emeritus at Harvard Law School. Specializing in constitutional law and theory, including comparative constitutional law, he is also a legal historian, particularly constitutional history, with works on the development of civil rights law in the U.S. and a history of the Supreme Court in the 1930s. Boyan Bugaric is a professor of law at the University of Sheffield Law School, coming all to us from across the ocean. He researches in the fields of constitution and comparative constitutional law, public law, EU law, law and democracy, and law and development broadly conceived. He served as deputy minister at the Ministry of the Interior in the Slovenian government from the year 2000 to 2004. Tom Ginsburg is the Leo Spitz Professor of International Law at the University of Chicago Law School, where his research focuses on competitive, comparative and international law from an interdisciplinary perspective. He is co-director of the Comparative Constitutions Project, an effort funded by the National Science Foundation to gather and analyze the constitutions of independent nation states since 1789. Lawrence Lessig, is the Roy L. Furman Professor of Law and Leadership at Harvard Law School. Cited by the New Yorker as the most important thinker on intellectual property in the internet era, Lessig has focused most of, his, most of his career, much of his career, on law and technology, especially as it affects copyright. His current work addresses institutional corruption, relationships which, while legal, weaken public trust in an institution, especially as that affects democracy. Sanford Sandy V. Levinson is the W. St. John Garwood and W. St. John Garwood Jr. Centennial Chair <laughs> in Law at the University of Texas Law School and a visiting professor at Harvard Law School. He is an expert on constitutional law and has written four books exploring the First Amendment, constitutional decision making, and issues of governments in constitutional uh, systems. I now turn it over to Professor Garich. There'll be about 40 minutes of discussion, and after that, there'll be a Q&A. Thank you very much, everyone, for participating today, and thank you very much to our participants for listening. Thank you very much, Debbie. So I'll uh, start with a very, very brief introduction to our book. Uh, just to uh, talk about four key points, four key messages, and then I'll turn to uh, three distinguished discussants in the alphabetical order. First, Professor Ginsburg, then Professor Lessig, and then Professor Sandy Lewison, and then Professor Mark Tashnet will respond at the end uh, in conclusion, and then we'll open for Q&A. So the four key points about our book. So what was the animating spirit behind the book? Actually, we tried to challenge the mainstream, the dominant view that populism is always, in every instance, antithetical, inimical, incompatible with constitutionalism. That's what bothered us, and we wanted to explore this claim empirically and to look whether it's correct and it's not. So our first move was that, and that's my second point, instead of debating populism as a general phenomenon, as an abstract phenomenon, which is often what happens in the literature, we wanted to move debate to a more empirical level. So we tried to discuss populism in a socio-legal attempt study of populism and constitutionalism in its many forms and empirical variations. That's why we uh, devoted part of the book to various so-called case studies where we research particular countries, regions, in order to explore the relationship between the two phenomena. Uh, the third move 
is that after carefully studying those examples, we came to one first, I think, important conclusion that populism is not always inimical, incompatible with constitutionalism. Uh, what we find is that when it is incompatible, it is often that those are populist dressed up uh, as autocrats that try to challenge and violate some basic key constitutional norms of liberal constitutionalism. And uh, the, the fourth point is that sometimes populism is a needed corrective to anti-democratic tendencies in current politics around the world. So not every criticism of constitutional veto points in constitutional system will lead to tyranny. Sometimes, we argue, we need a strong dosage of populist elements in order to make constitutional system a little bit more democratic. Uh, but again, the answers always depend on a particular context. I think that's one of the major sub-themes of our book. So with these short, brief points, I would like to give the floor to our discussant, and we'll start with Professor Tom Ginsburg first. Excellent. Thank you both so much. It's a kind of dream team to see you two writing together. Uh, both of you have been approaching this issue from you know, your own distinct vantage points, and I think uh, together you produce something really important. That's kind of a defense of some populism. So quali populism, a qualified defense, it could have been called. called. Um, and um, I think that's obviously a valuable corrective between the other two poles that we see, which is populism as epithet, right? Often used for political movements we don't like, uh, and populism as political program, which is you know, an unqualified good because the people are always right. The style is kind of a counter-punching style, and I really like that, I mean, sort of, a lot of this uh, material I've read. So I, I liked reading your take on uh, various folks. Um, and I think I am convinced, you know, that populism in some of its forms can be pluralist, you know, can be and is definitely deeply connected with notions of majoritarian democracy. It sort of can't exist apart from that. Um, I still am a little skeptical um, of most populisms that I've encountered. And I'd like to explain why. And that mainly it has to do with my view of constitutional democracy, something which doesn't quite fit in your definition, which is, um, I might summarize by saying democracy requires bureaucracy, right? You, in any democratic system, you have majoritarian rule, you need someone neutral counting the votes. You need, uh, you know, non-politicized bureaucrats to implement policies. You need a sort of zone of, you know, technocratic um, competence and such. And this is particularly true in the context of democratic backsliding, which is the background risk of those who criticize populism. I mean, what we see when we observe democratic backsliding, whether by populists or others, is that the actors which restrain it are not themselves grounded in political, in um, electoral, you know, democracy, right? Not democratically elected institutions, bureaucrats who count votes, like in the United States in 2020, courts, militaries that don't intervene or sometimes do um, when there's a threat. Um, lots of you know, neutral institutions are necessary to make bureaucracy work. And my concern about this sort of, I mean, I think you acknowledge this in your discussion of courts, you really get to this, but it's a broader phenomenon. And the reason I think it's important um, is because the zone of technocracy, do you think is okay as long as there's no political disagreements about stuff. You know, the zone is itself endogenous to political mobilization, right? So to, or to political style. And one of the things that I think we observe with lots and lots of populist movements, and I won't say all, is a desire to shrink that space. That is to actually undermine the institutions, which are all institutions thus, you know, maybe to put it simply, are conceived of as being with us or against us, with the people or not even if the people are conceived of in a plural way. Um, and so I think that there's this tendency to politicize these neutral institutions which, on which survival, on whose survival democracy depends. Now, um, this gets to sort of, you know, I think one thing your book does well, or when we think of populism, it's, a, it's obviously kind of an idiom of mobilization that works Differently, I think once you know when it's out of power, when it's mobilizing, trying to take power, than when it's in power. And I think what you do and show is that some populists don't always abuse the power once they they take it. 
That is one way to think about it is they use populism for mobilization, but then really shift away. Rafael Correa was not a populist once he took power, in my view. Um, he ran as a populist, but then governed as a kind of, you know, technocrat in some ways or, or something like that. And so I think that's an important distinction, how do populists act when they're out of power and when, they, when they're in. Um, and thus, I think that the reason that distinction is important because it leads to, in my view, a slightly different take on what you sometimes call the institutional fine tuning that um, populists engage in when dealing with courts and others. So just to give three examples, I'm much less sympathetic with um, uh, Morales, Evo Morales in Bolivia, when, and just for those who don't know the details, you know, he wanted to extend his term in power. He had a referendum. He lost that referendum and then got his constructed constitutional court to, uh, to say, well, of course, you know, any interference on his ability to run for re-election is a violation of the fundamental principles of democracy. And he ran again. So that's a, that, that is, uh, to me, a threat to constitutional democracy. Now it turns out the, his opponents were particularly sympathetic people and didn't behave very well once they took power. But the point is that escalation that he engaged in prompted a response. And um, so I'm not at all sympathetic with that. You don't talk about the Honduras case, but I think that's a similar case of Manuel Zelaya in 2009, which is popularly characterized as a coup. But remember it is Zelaya who was violating the terms of his constitution to call for the extension of his term and the military didn't govern for a day. So I, don't like his political opponents, but I don't think that we should have any sympathy with that attempt at fine tuning the institution so he can stay around. And Syriza, this is really a question. You make a lot out of Syriza, the Greek party, uh, populist party. And I guess my reading, I, you know, I'm convinced, I have no reason to disagree with your account of it. My question for you is, are you so sure they wouldn't have gone further <laughs> and been anti-institutional had they had the political strength to do so, right? They never had a majority by your account. And so in a way it's an easy case. So, yeah, populists don't always overturn constitutional democracy. Well, only when they, you know, populists who have the ability to do so often do. And Manuel Zelaya is kind of an intermediate case. Morales had a lot of strength, Syria's had not enough. Zelaya thought he didn't, he didn't. So I'm, I, I, I guess I'm concerned about being sympathetic. Now, uh, let me just close by talking about the last couple of chapters um, on referenda and deliberative polling, which are really interesting innovations. I'm very excited about all the innovations in um, you know, remaking democracy for the 21st century through things like deliberative polling. Um, but I felt it was like a little orthogonal <laughs> to your account, you know, to, your, to your claim. Populists, actually existing populists aren't big fans of deliberation generally speaking, um, at least yeah, not charismatic populists, right? They wanna represent the unified people. They don't want the, pe the plural people to deliberate and you know, elaborate on the message or change things. And so you know, I thought that there was very important innovation for democracy and might fit well with some good populists, but we don't really observe that. On referenda, I wasn't convinced by your claim that populists aren't plebiscitary. And I think it's an empirical question, which you would have to look at and show me some evidence. You basically say, look, in COVID, there's lots of different policies. You know, if, if, some, if someone's really plebiscitary, we'd see them throw these possible policies open to the public and we get a majoritarian, you know, outcome. And no one did that. But of course, no non-populists did that either. Um, it just maybe too much uncertainty or something like that. So I guess I need more to be convinced that the plebiscitary populists, which I think of, Hugo Chavez, you know, to some degree, Orban by always having constitutional amendments and such, like, sort of appealing to the Guava constituent all the time, that they aren't the norm. Maybe they aren't, maybe they aren't, I just don't. Um, and my final comment is, you know, this, I just, I guess my, con convinced as I am that populism is very important as a force for mobilization, I really worry about the leaders, right? Charismatic populism is what I talk about in my work. And um, I, the manipulation of the, of the populist movement by a leader who is, seeks to, by definition, dismantle intermediate institutions seems to me a pretty common phenomenon. 
And your book doesn't really talk too much about the leaders. I mean, you talk about specific leaders, but about leadership in terms of whether we get good populism or bad. All that said, thank you very much for the terrific contribution. I'm excited for more Tushnet and Bugarich. Um, so I'll just jump right in. Um, thank you so much for inviting me and giving me an opportunity to think deeply about this really incredible book. I wanna make three points. Um, the first point is really a point about how the idea of populism might be um, generalized even more. I was reminded as I went through the accounts that you were offering of these various types of populism, the, the sense in which they all speak to what Kramer, Larry Kramer would have thought of as the people themselves present in a political system. Um, in some sense, feeling themselves entitled to their claimed power because of their belief that the government has become corrupted. And that of course embeds an idea of what the government should be and what corruption would be. And, and that idea of course in various contexts could be very ugly if the idea of corruption is that we are no longer a white nationalist nation the way we're supposed to be. Obviously nobody would um, endorse that or none of us would endorse that idea, but it's still a conception of how the government is not living up to the ideals that it is supposed to live up to and, and therefore the outside is allowed to step in. And what's interesting about that is it's a certain idealism that motivates this energy and idealism about what the nation's supposed to be. So that's the first idea about how this could be generalized a bit more. The second idea is, a, is really a, a, a skeptic, skepticism about the particular way in which we you're conceiving of constitutionalism, or maybe an invitation to uh, ask um, or to address whether there's an implicit idea here that's not surfaced enough. Um, you know, in American constitutional law, we like to obsess about the counter-majoritarian difficulty. All of that proceeds as if counter to the counter-majoritarian difficulty is a majoritarian enterprise, um, as if um, the nation or the constitutional system itself is majoritarian. Um, and obviously in the United States, we're coming to very quickly, I hope, to the recognition that we are a deeply minoritarian constitutional structure. I mean, starting with state legislatures, which because of the way gerrymandering functions are eff effectively minoritarian. And after the 22, uh, the, the 20 census and redistricting, I think you'll see the United States House of Representatives being deeply minoritarian. The Electoral College functioning in a minoritarian way, or at least focusing attention to a small slice of America, the so-called swing states that um, carry all of the weight in the election. And then of course, most egregiously the Senate, not just the population in, in inequalities in the Senate, um, but the idea that we've evolved the notion that a rule, the filibuster rule can govern practically any important decision of the Senate leads to the conclusion that for almost any decision of the Senate, except for budget reconciliations and some nominations, um, 21 states representing as little as 21% of America's population, and of course the most extreme 21% of America's population, have the capacity to block democratic, democratic action. Um, and, and so I just wonder whether in the con con context of thinking about what a constitution is there isn't more work to be done about the relationship between the constitutionalism, the liberal constitutionalism you're describing and majoritarianism as an essential qualification for it. But third, and, and the point I wanna express most strongly, um, as, as attracted as I am to the idea that we take seriously the people in the context of populism, um, I think we should feel entitled to be more critical about how the people speak in the context of populism. Um, it feels in many moments in this uh, really extraordinary work that you're almost too tolerant about the choices that people might be making um, between direct or deliberative or representative democracy. And I say too tolerant because we know enough to know um, uh, when the people could know um, in a way in which they themselves should feel um, or should believe in um, 
what they what they should do in any particular moment. One striking change in American constitutional uh, in the American constitutional context is over the last twenty years, the proportion of Americans who have faith in the political choices of Americans has gone from basically two thirds having faith in the late nineteen nineties to two thirds no longer having faith. Um, and and that's in some sense the people themselves coming to recognize whether the people themselves are capable of making the judgments of political decisions. And what I suggest is that we need to think more carefully about the conditions within which or in which um, the people could be uh, reliably called upon or think of themselves as reliably called upon to make those decisions. And this is especially important um, when we think about the evolution of the architecture of media that stands behind these particular stories of populism. I'm a very strong um, disciple of uh, Marcus Pryor's work in Princeton, who insists that one big problem in political science is the failure always to account for the architecture of media that exists at any particular moment in the story of politics that's being told. Um, and I think that in our particular moment, this is a part of the story that we, we should be doing being much more uh, vocal about. Um, we know, for example, in the context of the current explosion of social media, um, uh, that there's a that you know an extraordinary amount of pressure placed within the political system to drive people into partisan uh, corners. Um, that this is a this is not a bug. This is a feature of the system because the more they can enrage us and polarize us, the more profit they make. This, of course, was the focus of the testimony today by the Facebook whistleblower before Congress. Um, and, and I think that the point a populist should uh, take on from that is to recognize that in counseling one form of engagement or another, whether it's deliberative polling or referendum or representatives, these facts about the uh, context of media and the way in which the people themselves come to know the issues that they are supposed to be deciding upon should be right in the front. Um, and that the product then of that decision, how to um, uh, move forward, um, should be driven by these facts about how we know how the people are coming to understand this. Now, this is a kind of call for an epistemology of, of democracy, not to be uh, epistocrats as you identify them, not to say that only the smart should be engaged, but to be realists about how the people are engaged or how they understand what they are engaging with so that we can guide them um, uh, or guide the process in a way that brings out the best of them when they are playing their role as in some sense, the ultimate check on the corrupted forms of otherwise constitutional democracy. Um, um, so those are three small points I, I'm, I'm eager to offer and, and happy to defend. See, thank you. Um, first of all, I want to express not only my gratitude for being here, but to confirm the other two speakers that this really is an absolutely terrific, terrific book that deserves to be read and discussed. If there's one overarching theme, um, I think it is the importance of context and the adoption of a phrase that is often associated particularly with Mark, it all depends. So I have nothing useful to say about the specific country examples that make the book so rich because I frankly don't know enough to offer any serious assessment or critique of what they say about um, a whole variety um, of countries. Um, and so I'll let it go at that. What I'd like to do is to take roughly two minutes a piece to raise four more general issues. The first one is in part how one identifies populism. And this perhaps picks up a little bit on Tom's comment about institutionalism and anti-institutionalism. If I have a reputation in the legal academy, it is probably because I am more openly hostile 
to the current US Constitution than practically any other mainstream academic. Uh, I want a new constitutional convention, and I really think that the Constitution is a clear and present danger to our survival as a national political order, and perhaps to our survival in the world, given the importance of the United States in responding to climate issues. So does that make me a populist? From one perspective, if one really defines populism as being anti-institutional, then I suppose the answer has to be kind of, and I'm certainly hostile to those political elites who either praise the constitution or simply say, we shouldn't worry about the constitution so much because other things are um, so much more important that the constitution basically becomes nugatory as significant. Um, so this depends obviously on how one defines populism. That brings me to my second point. I think that one of the most important contributions of the book is the distinction it draws between what might be called national self-determination, something identified with Woodrow Wilson, whom I've argued in other writings may be the most important single political figure in the 20th century, and popular uh, sovereignty. National self-determination, I have come to the conclusion, is one of the most pernicious ideas floating around because it really does ultimately reinforce the notion of I'm folk, I'm nation, I'm polity. It requires us to decide who is within the nation and who is out. And I've come to the conclusion that there really are no attractive forms of nationalism. There may be more unattractive forms than others. But I think that all nationalisms in the 21st century are basically dangerous, maybe with the exception of Iceland. But I frankly don't know enough about Iceland to know whether they can sustain a nation state. But I suppose I'm reflecting the influence of my old teacher, Judith Schlar, who was a militant op opponent or skeptic about nationalism. But nationalism does not coincide with popular sovereignty, which basically focuses on the fact that a lot of people are occupying a given territory and they are not united by national characteristics. Um, uh, I often cite, usually adversely, Federalist Number 2, in which John Day Jay says, we're all alike in language, religion, background. This is preposterous, but it raises interesting questions as to why he thought it was necessary to uh, focus on this alleged homogeneity. What you can say is what we share is a territorial identity and people who live within a certain territory ought to be allowed to engage in self-determination. And I think the most value, one of the most valuable contributions of the book is to say that you can be a populist and a pluralist at the same time. It rejects the argument made by Jan Werner Mueller that it's a defining characteristic of populists that they're nationalists, uh, saying that we the people speak with one voice. No, I think that's empirically false, at least in some countries. Uh, but I think what they do identify very valuably is that this is almost always an attack on elites who are in charge of the country at any given moment. Um, so instead of cl old fashioned class conflict, you often have a revolt against technocracy. And I think it is important. I think Tom is absolutely right um, in saying that we cannot do without bureaucrats and technocrats, but they should be kept in their place. And the central issue of politics perhaps is trying to figure out how one balances necessary technocratic administration with genuine popular control. Next issue, very quickly. 
Lewis Kornhauser a number of years ago suggested that we retire the notion of judicial independence because it's just so difficult to the point of impossibility to figure out exactly what it means. That's important within the context of the book because they point out that populists are often in fact do go after judiciaries or are accused of trying to limit and attack judicial independence and judicial independence is thought automatically to be a good thing. Well, first of all, we have to define judicial independence. And again, there is a range that they talk about, for example, the way judges are selected in India and until fairly recently in Israel. And what you had was almost genuine institutional self-perpetuation that I compare to the French Academy or the Harvard Corporation where those who control the institution right now get to pick their successors with no outside interference. It seems to me that sort of judicial independence raises its problems. The other side of the coin of how one chooses judges is say the national government of the United States or the state of Texas in the United States has a thoroughly politicized way of choosing judges. And it's one president and a compliant party in the Senate that places judges. In Texas, we elect every judge. And let me say, having observed the national judicial appointment process over the last several decades, I am no longer certain that election of judges a la Texas is so much worse than the kind of thoroughly politicized judicial process we have at the national level of the United States. But then there are all sorts of intermediate issues. There's also the issue of how long people serve. Are Ruth Ginsburg and Steve Breyer testaments to the glories of judicial independence that they can serve forever at their own volition? Or is it legitimate to believe that 18 years is enough? Um, in any event, I think that the book ought to inspire more discussions of what one means by judicial independence, rather than simply to use it as a mantra um, to castigate certain, um, you know, presumably populist movements. The last point, I have a minute and a half left, is to touch on what Tom raised about the endorsement of deliberative polls, or what I prefer to call deliberative assemblies, citizen juries in the last chapter. Um, I'm very taken by a book that in fact, Larry introduced me to, a book by a Belgian, David von Rybruck, Against Elections, The Case for Democracy. And it's a very strong endorsement of things like Jim Fishkin's deliberative assemblies. The most striking argument he makes that I think is correct, though I think it's certainly worth a lot of debate, is that any trained social scientist will in fact believe that a well-chosen, relatively small random group will be more representative than the United States House of Representatives, that it is almost bizarre to view the people's house as representative. The Gallup poll um, asking roughly 700 to 1,100 people comes up with a very good national representative sample. Now, this argument sounds crazy. It sounds anti-democratic, but I think it points to the difference between thinking like a social scientist and thinking like an old fashioned member of the public who says, well, the only way you can have representative democracy is through elections. I think that's something worth discussing. So um, thank you. Uh, I guess, I don't know whether I'm now being the featured speaker or not, but uh, I appreciate these all very stimulating comments. And 
um, it would take more than five minutes to uh, address uh, all of the uh, points that were made. Uh, so I'm going to focus on uh, just a, a few. Uh, the first is to start with Larry Lessig's observation about the uh, anti-majoritarian features of, he talks about the US, but uh, of the governance structures that populist mobilizations in, his, in, in um, Tom's terms, uh, around the world focus on. Uh, that is, I, I wouldn't want to say all, but a very large number of the populist mobilizations occur because the structures in place manifestly, or at least are claimed by the populist movement's leaders to manifestly um, do not represent the either views or interests of um, the, the, the nation's people. Um, and so the, the, these movements are motivated by a concern about uh, re-establishing, uh, that again, re-establishing is uh, biases the inquiry, but uh, re-establishing majoritarian control. But, and this gets to a point that Tom made about, uh, I'd say, put it this way, the scope of majoritarian control. Um, and here, um, the, the, he, he says there, you have to have some uh, space for technocratic, bureaucratic, neutral, uh, above politics decision making with respect to some matters, um, and and I, that's true. Uh, uh, I think we argue in the book that once again, to quote Sandy, quoting me, it all depends on the nature of the challenge to the neutral bureaucratic institutions in place. Um, so. Uh, uh, our, I, one of our arguments, I think this is explicit in the book, is that <clears throat> it's, it's often easy to frame the particular challenges to institutional structures that populists mount as challenges not to the general idea of technocracy, bureaucracy, um, some space for political neutrality on, uh, but for the version of neutrality in Sandy's example, the version of judicial independence that functions as an obstacle to the accomplishment of the non-institutionally, uh, um, um, com non-institutional components of the populist agenda. That is, they want to get stuff done. The people elect them to get stuff done. And some of these institutions are uh, veto gates. Uh, that's, what that's what they're supposed to do. Um, and that's what constitutional is, is. So they want to alter the veto gates. Uh, and whether that's a good or a bad thing will depend on a combination of the nature of the veto, uh, the, the nature of the institution they're challenging, and the merits of the program that the populists find uh, being obstructed. Um, so uh, uh, now none of this is to say that every particular attack on existing institutions is, uh, every, is, is justifiable. Um, we think that the better way to think about these questions is not to focus on the fact that the institutions are being challenged, but on the motivation, the nature of the challenger's overall political agenda. Um, so uh, for example, um, uh, this is 
to take the judicial independence examples that I know uh, probably best, um, the Indian reform proposal had virtually unanimous support in the parliament. I think there was one vote against it. Um, it has cross party support because it was a, because the existing system was bizarre, uh, unique and almost unique in the world, uh, and almost certainly rationally indefensible in terms of judicial independence in any reasonably democratic system. On the other hand, Modi is trying to intimidate individual judges and um, probably succeeding in doing so. And so you might say, well, although there was cross-party support for this, in the context of India, given who Modi is, it was a bad idea. We actually take no position on that. Our, our, our final line about the Indian reform is that uh, it, it, the Indian Supreme Court's position may have been uh, justifiable, but because of local uh, conditions. Um, and I think that's going to, my view is that that's going to be true uh, uh, pretty much across the board. Uh, again, that the intent of the, um, of the um, anti-institutional people with respect to things other than the institutions that they're challenging uh, is what matters. Uh, then the, the final point, I'm running out of time and I do want to get people engaged, is uh, about uh, uh, Larry's uh, point about um, the conditions for um, uh, determining uh, what the people truly want, and truly in some sense. Um, I, I do know that uh, there's an emerging in this small literature, an emerging controversy over the extent to which um, you can blame the people for in the particular examples are Hungary and Poland. They are after all voting for these uh, uh, um, autocrats. Um, there's a story in the newspaper yesterday about uh, uh, Duterte in the Philippines nominally stepping aside from politics, but actually seeking to retain his position by governing through or with his daughter, I think it is. Um, and in the course of the discussion, Duterte, who is clearly uh, a, a, an autocratic, I'd say, thug, the story says he nonetheless remains quite popular. Um, well, okay, so maybe it is the people that we have to worry about. But, and this gets to the final point and some of the stuff about deliberative assemblies and so on. Um, one of the things that we talk about uh, in these reform proposal, populist oriented reform proposals is what I, I think Boyan is less convinced of this than I am, but uh, a radical decentralization uh, uh, where decisions, authoritative decisions, will be taken at a very low level in face-to-face -face discussions among people who I think of as neighbors. Um, and uh, where the possibility of um, overcoming or modifying the uh, media environment that Larry talks about uh, is, in my view, greater uh, than with, again, than with, in particular, with referenda. Um, and we do talk about the importance for good policymaking of uh, what some social scientists call local knowledge, uh, uh, shop floor knowledge in another context. Um, and the advantage of uh, relying on that through, again, my ideas about radical decentralization is that it's uh, local knowledge is a counter epistemology to the messages that are being sent from the larger media environment. Okay, my time's up. Uh, uh, so uh, we'll, we will move to the questions uh, section. Um, 
and uh, you're, you see, um, you should ask questions, I guess, in the question and answer function, or maybe we can see raise, use the raise hand function. Um, yes. Oh. Um, yes. Thank you, Professor Tushnet. Um, so yes, I, I would encourage our attendees to use the Q&A function in Zoom. Um, so yes, we're going to move into our Q&A section right now. Um, and our first question, uh, which is not specified for a particular person, so I guess anyone can answer. Our first question, Hillary Clinton recently stated in an interview, quote, we are in the middle of a constitutional crisis and minority rule will be what we live under, the norm, end quote. The U.S. has an interesting populist movement in that it is generally affiliated with this minority rule. How do you see current domestic populism operating when, as a movement, it supports a minority rule? Yeah, um, so that's a really interesting question. Um, and it's, I, I need to think more about it. Um, I do have some concerns about characterizing Trumpism as a form of populism. Um, I, what I have in mind here is the study that Theta Scotchpole and one of her co-authors did about the Tea Party movement, uh, which was is represented as a precursor to Trumpism. Uh, and Scotchpole's argument is that the Tea Party movement was a construct of um, um, right-wing elites. Um, now, I don't, you know, I don't know uh, whether that's a fair characterization of uh, the Trump uh, movement. Um, uh, it's, um, I guess, I'm, I guess my, I don't know what the, what, kind of how to characterize this, but my, my initial thinking is that, well, yeah, uh, we say you got to pay attention to particulars and we don't claim that populism is as such good. Uh, there may be um, bad populisms. Uh, I think we actually are explicit in saying this somewhere that uh, ethno-nationalist populism, which is what um, uh, Jan Warner Muller and Cass Moody uh, uh, talk mostly about, is basically a bad idea. Sandy suggested that as well. Um, and so, and, may, and Trumpism may be uh, the US version of uh, ethno-nationalism. And so for that reason uh, would be a bad form of populism. On the other hand, you know, to say, Trump and Bernie Sanders are the same because they both appeal to the people seems to me uh, just completely misleading. Um, so, so I wonder if I, could add, if I could add to that because I would think that this is a great opportunity for promoting more populism. I mean, because I think what you're seeing is um, as I was describing it, the populist is appealing to what it thinks is, are, thinks are the values that have been corrupted. And there's a certain version of the Trumpian populism, which is saying that the values of America, the nationalist white um, dominant America have been corrupted. Like that's the problem with immigrants or that's the problem with uh, minorities. Obviously I reject that, I think that's wrong, but that's animating um, much of it. What Hillary Clinton should be arguing for is a populism on her side. There ought to be a populism that's saying, we have corrupted the basic idea of majoritarian representative democracy in America. We've allowed the institutions to evolve in a way that deny the majority the ability to govern, not in Bill of Rights contexts, not in the places where we obsess about the counter-majoritarian difficulty, in the places where the majority is supposed to be able to rule. And, and I think that what would get us movement in the direction that Hillary Clinton was pointing to is a little bit more populism on that side of the argument. And I think Bernie was actually pushing that conception of populism. So they were both populists, but the values that they were and that were animating those two populisms, I think were very different. If I can jump in for just a second, um, my irritation unto anger 
with Bernie Sanders now over two presidential cycles is that the senator from Vermont with 650,000 people never once suggested that there, there's any real problem with basic constitutional structures. And so I think he did end up being a very unfortunate sort of populist in that I think there was a lot of magical thinking involved because he never addressed the problem of veto points, of institutional reforms that might be necessary. Um, I've often written that my favorite presidential election was that in 1912, when you had presidential candidates running as serious constitutional reformers. And Sanders could have done that. One did not expect Hillary Clinton to do that, but one might have expected Bernie Sanders to be as critical as of American institutions as, say, Eugene V. Debs or even Woodrow Wilson and Teddy Roosevelt. And that is what so depresses me about current American politics. Um, and the lack of an institutional critique as part of our, you know, ordinary political dialogue. Thank you. Um, we also have a follow-up question uh, from that question. I think this is this will be our last audience question, and then we'll unfortunately have to wrap it up. Um, so this next question: Romanticism seems integral to populist rule but romanticism usually follows along previous norms, often white, often male, often discussion conditions of capitalism, and sometimes incorporating majoritarian faith. How do you see this working in the narrative many populist movements have, have of being oppressed when in fact they are usually, if only historically, main oppressors? Is class the key factor here or is something else going on? So let me uh, uh, respond to that in with two observations. Uh, first, um, there's no doubt that in particular in our uh, discussion in the last part of the book about populist reforms that there's a certain kind of romanticism uh, um, sort of going, you know, it's captured in the, the historical evocation of the book's title, Power of the People, which was part of the, in my experience at least, the, the movements of 1968. Um, um, so there is, there, there is that. Um, it, toward the end of the book, one of, in motivating the idea of local knowledge, I came up with the idea again, boy, and is a little more skeptical about it than I am. Uh, about making COVID policy at the local level um, and uh, talk about some, um, um, you know, how deliberations about pub closings in uh, uh, Great Britain might have gone uh, in, in uh, if, it were, if, if the policy were, could be set at the local level. And I think it, it's fair to say that these concerns about who would be participating in the discussions and what their presuppositions would be uh, might well uh, uh, come into play. Um, but on the other hand, uh, I, I do want to stress that um, at least some, I, I think, the, 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 some of the movements are, are of, uh, that I find most interesting are neither are not class-based and are movements of the genuinely oppressed. Um, so uh, uh, the, this is, I think, most clear in, uh, the, in the case of Bolivia and Evo Morales. Uh, uh, it's a, the details of the case are complicated and I don't wanna get into you know, what the end game was like, um, but Evo Morales was the leader of an indigenous movement in a nation where indigenous people had been treated, and I, I like to use Hannah Arendt's terms, treated as subjects rather than citizens. And the movement was a um, movement 
uh, to transform subjects into citizens. My own view, this is much more controversial and I don't uh, attribute this to Boyan at all, is that Hugo Chavez had a similar position uh, in Venezuela. Um, his successor Maduro is a different matter, but uh, Chavez was uh, a spokesperson for uh, a population that had been cut out of elite negotiations and politics for generations. And he was, um, the response was by the previous elites was, how could this boorish lower class person possibly run a government? Um, and so, uh, there are clash issues in Venezuela, of course. In, in Bolivia, it is the indigenous people. Anyway, I, I think the, uh, the point about romanticism is, is clearly, I, for me, right. I think the question about the components of the populist movements will uh, be answered differently uh, in connection with different uh, 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 sections. Uh, I, we're, we're coming to the end. I, Boyan, do you wanna say something before uh, the wrap up? Just a quick, just a quick uh, response or follow up. Uh, actually, to the first, the very first question that we had, uh, and Professor Lessig's point about minority rule, and also the uh, the other questions in in the same issue in India. There is a very interesting uh, attempt uh, in the literature trying to respond to this phenomenon under the label of uh, plutocratic populism by Hacker and Pearson. Let's them in their tweets, which partially try to respond. It so we have. People who you know who are populist in a way, but only in mostly in their rhetoric, but they deliver to the elites. And uh, we honestly we don't touch upon this issue very extensively in the book. Maybe we have a couple of footnotes there, but uh, but I wanted just to put on record that there is a concept that tries to respond to this problem. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize. I have to jump to another talk. I'm grateful for being invited, and and thank you again for this really wonderful book. Thank you, Professor Lessig, and thank you all uh, so much for, for joining today. Um, I just wanted to give a few closing remarks as we're coming up to our time. Um, our next book talk will be on Thursday, October 14th at 1230 on Zoom uh, for Professor Randall Kennedy's book, Say It Loud. Um, you can read more and register on the library website. Um, and so once again, I would just like to thank our panelists for joining us uh, and thank you all attendees for, uh, for being a captive audience today. Uh, thanks so much. <laughs>